giving a little lecture about the learning model and explaining it to us all. And it continued as we went around to the different places. It was bringing life and dynamism back into the models. Um, and I believe that that is what the Joker helps to do. Because uh, <clears throat> So I'll leave you with that thought about the Joker while I set up uh, the next exercise. You might have a question you want to ask about this. So why, not, while I'm doing this, I need mean, just a little break. If you chat with a partner about the Joker, do you connect with the Joker? Do you find it a useful concept? Does it connect with other thoughts? <coughs> Okay, uh, this um, exercise I'll be inviting you to do is called a simultaneous survey, or sim survey for short. Um, it has many applications, um, the most ordinary most ordinary and kind of useful application is uh, say you go and have a meeting and you have um, six topics could be any number but we'll say six and say you conveniently have six people in the meeting um, oh no but let's, let's make it twelve people so twelve people in the meeting and you have six topics so you um, allocate the topics to pairs, and they become specialists in each of those topics. And then people get up and move around, and they interview people one-to-one, -one and then reform. And when you get to topic one on the agenda, the two experts who've just done the survey uh, report back on what they've discovered. So the benefits you get at the beginning of a meeting, they become very sociable. Lots and lots of one-to-one -one conversations. It's also a time saver because um, it saves people repeating. Um, um, often in a meeting you get one person says something, another person speaks, and they say more or less the same thing. They just simply want to be heard. But they're really just saying exactly the same thing. Simple same thing is survey condenses it all down. And it might say, no, four people were of this view. And that saves a lot of time. Uh, that is also saves time because amongst 12 people, <coughs> excuse me, amongst 12 people, uh, it's, it's polite for only one person to be talking at a time. So that means 11 people are not engaged in a conversation when one person is talking. If you do a simultaneous survey, everyone is engaged in conversation. Um, so it's a much faster, quicker way of collecting information from a group. So that's what I'm. Um, suggesting, and we're going to put that to the test now, you'll have five minutes to carry out a survey. And your survey topic will be one of these 17 questions here. So uh, I would like uh, each, it doesn't matter if they're different numbers, but up to about six people, a group of up to about six people would, uh, would work. So if you already happen to be sat at a table about that size, I would say um, yeah, between, let's make it between four and six, that allows you a bit of an adjustment. Um, and I was going to allocate numbers, but I think that will take too long. Uh, so you can just make a secret choice of number. So your first job as a group of four or six is to decide which of these appeals to you. If I've used Agile all the way through, but if you want to adjust it to some other Agile term, um, you're like Scrum, for example, then you might want to focus on Scrum. But, so you're welcome to adjust the question to make it uh, work better for you, but you can make your choice from these uh, 17. So um, when you've made your choice and you all agreed, 
that don't ask each other the question. Your answers come from everyone else. Your answers do not, in this case, this particular setup, your answers come from everyone else rather than from your particular group. So you need to, having a, done a quick little bit of group bonding, you then part from your group, go out into the big wide world, and try and get um, at least uh, five answers to your question in the five minutes that you have. Then you meet up in your group, and at that point I might cut the process short. But um, I'd like to do those first two parts of the process anyway. So first part, choose your question. Well, get into a suitable size group, choose one of the questions, adapt it if you need to. As soon as you've agreed, stand up and start moving around. When you meet someone, you both have a question for each other. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about the process? Okay. So, um, do you want to learn the best way to do agile? Do it. No, I'm not. 
<laughs> okay. Thank you. So, I'm stealing a bit of uh, in between time there. So, if you want to follow that up, that's given you a, a, a start of a conversation with some uh, other people in, in the room. But that would not be the usual way to finish. But I think you've experienced the, the key part of the process and see how it works. Uh, one very useful application I find for a simultaneous survey is giving feedback. Happens, you sit in a circle and you find feedback from the group for the person on your left. So um, you, you, you then go and you do your survey and you get positive feedback or whatever kind of feedback you're looking for. Um, you go around the group asking for feedback about the person who was on your left. And then at the end of the survey process, you go to that person and you meet them. That I've, um, that this is what I've found, how people see you. Uh, and how, they, how you contribute to the team. This, the, or these are the strengths or characteristics that other people consider to be your, your greatest strengths in the team. So it's uh, a little bit easier than just going up to someone and saying, what do you think of my greatest strengths? Maybe it is easy in this country, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's a little bit easier if somebody else is doing it for you. Uh, and it can be done anonymously too. There's, there's no need to say, this is what that person said, this is what that person said. Because the spirit of a survey is done anonymously. So I find it very useful uh, feedback technique as well. Do you use that for, you know, like open-ended, so if somebody has negative things they want to whisper about somebody, or do you, do you struggle I've, with their strengths or values? Yeah, I've, I've only used it with a positive emphasis, positive. but the structure could be used for other more specific purposes. I, I don't imagine it would be very useful looking at weaknesses, but you may judge that that's okay. okay. No. I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> yeah. Is there uh, any like percentage of survey that you should get done to uh, have it valid? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I usually say uh, at the beginning that in most surveys, it's, it's a bit like a street survey. So in most surveys, if you uh, are above 50%, uh, I, I, Ask people aim for at least 50%. But, but you have to do the, the maths or the math in, in, in advance to, um, uh, and, and, and to, to work out what the percentage is and how many. You know, you, you need to calculate it all and predict it because if you're not careful at the end, if you are doing the feedback at the end, it can take a very long time if you've had too many questions. So you do need to calculate things and anticipate how much feedback time is needed if you follow through the whole process. But, uh, yeah. Just to build on that, you would actually precisely analytically measure the results. Like, I mean, we do it very quickly, but if we were doing this formally, like people would have a notepad or something to actually yeah. say, I got five people that said this, two that said this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you could report on percentages. It depends a bit on the nature of the question. Um, some. Some feedback you could count and express as percentages, and others it's really just a collection of stories. So it depends on the nature of the questions you're asking. Okay, uh, thank you for those questions. I'd like to move on to um, another process, and I'm um, roughly following the cycle. This was about collecting stories, so collecting stories would have uh, belonged on the red side of the cycle with the diamonds and the hearts. So we weren't digging into them in any way, we are just simply sharing those stories. So what you've, uh, but simultaneous survey could be applied to um, deeper questions with a spade, or they could be applied to futures. In fact, one of those was about the future. So it's not limited to storytelling, it can be used at any part of the cycle. But the primary use just now was in sharing stories. Okay. I'd now like to move on to the, um, the, the spade and digging a bit deeper and um, going for analysis. And this is an exercise called uh, Moving Stones. And it, um, but today it's moving chairs because uh, it's easier for you to see these chairs. 
It's a way of looking at group dynamics or team dynamics or system dynamics or organizational dynamics. Um, often it's done with um, charts and drawings and things, but I find using objects is itself more dynamic and brings a uh, few uh, advantages and benefits. What I'm going to do here with these six chairs is I'm going to make various arrangements of these chairs and uh, for today we'll assume each chair is a, represents a person and I would like to tell me what kind of group you see, what nature of team uh, do you see. And I've got one arrangement here already. So if this here was a group of people Uh, we have one suggestion already that maybe it's dysfunctional. <laughs> Hierarchical, but somewhat re reluctantly, following the leader, but not in the straight line. Oh. Yes? Is that going to send her a two? Yeah, they're Mostly. looking in all different directions. Yes? Mostly together, but a breakaway group. Yeah. Okay. Uh, finding solitude in a crowd. Mm -hmm. Well, the solitude. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Finding solitude in the crowd. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to make a slightly different arrangement, a very different arrangement now. This is, um, for those who can't quite see, I will also describe it. It's um, a, I'll try to describe it in a fairly neutral way. There's a circle of chairs over here. And there's one over here, and this is the whole group, all six chairs. Outlier. Outlier. of the island. Is this a good place to be? Shining. Could this be a good place to be? Let's change it. <laughs> What's it like to be this person in the group? Awkward, impressive. Elephant in the room. Chinese acrobats. <laughs> Some of these things you can't do with stones. So well, whatever the objects you are you're using, you've got the idea of it that you can create uh, different arrangements. One warning I give to people using this: any arrangement you make can have a positive interpretation or a negative interpretation. There's no single arrangement you can make and you say, "Well, that's bad." There's no merit in that whatsoever. There always is some merit in it, some, something positive that you can look, you can put on your other spectacles and look at it the other way and see the problems. Can we use this method the other way around as well where we actually tell the team, why don't you arrange the chairs the way you think we are right now? Can yes. we use the other okay. way around? Yeah. You, you kind of jumped ahead to part two. Right. Uh, what I'd like to do first of all is this little exercise so that people realize we're kind of talking in a bit of a metaphorical way, we're talking about <coughs> dynamics rather than a bird's eye view. Because sometimes when people do this, they just do a kind of bird's eye view. You know, this is where we sit, this is our office station, so, and that's the dynamics. It's not the dynamics, it's just where you sit. So um, I just do enough of this so that people see the possibilities of um, in interpretation. And then, part two, is uh, where you use objects to tell stories. And this is precisely what I'd like you to do now. I would like you, in groups of two, three, or four, to find a collection of objects. It need not be chairs, it could be chairs. It could be smaller objects, it could be objects you have about you. It could be your chocolates, or coins, or um, whatever objects you have to uh, talk about, to use these to help you to talk to the others in your group um, about a, um, either choose the topic of what Agile looks like when it's running perfectly, or um, confess to a story where things went a little bit wrong, but had a reasonably good outcome or, or a happy outcome. 
So you move the objects around to show where the problems came and how those problems were resolved. So I'd like to invite you for five minutes in groups of two, three, or four to find a suitable group of objects to explore either Agile at its best, as it shows you in all the books how it should happen, or Agile as it really happens uh, with a few bumpy things along the way but a reasonably successful outcome. Okay? Any questions about the process? One right here. Um, and to be clear, is this simply to tell the story, or is this getting into analysis and interpretation of what's happening? Uh, a good, good question. Um, I think it's difficult to use this as a pure storytelling without getting into analysis. I think that will happen automatically simply because of the storytelling tool that you're using. But it is, it is a, yeah, you, you, you can't avoid being analytical in, the, in using this method. Okay. Thank you. So please, uh, find, find a group. Yeah, five minutes. Five guys joining us. I hope you found that the process has some possibilities. It's uh, one that often happens quite naturally when you're at a restaurant and you're trying to explain something. <laughs> Pick up salt cellar, the cutlery, and move things around. <clears throat> if you don't do that already, you'll be find yourself starting to do it now. Uh, moving objects around can be a very useful way to present a... Uh, I'll take whatever. Yeah, we could. Yeah. Yeah, while it's hot. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick it up while it's hot. I was going to pick it up. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that now. So, um, you're, your question was about the process. Your question, Silvana, was what, what, what people have learned. Are we looking, because one focus is, one interesting thing is what you learn about Agile, another focus is what you learn about the technique. So what you learn about the technique, any learnings about the technique that anyone would care to share? I think it just stirs up that conversation. You know, a lot of times you have developers, you know, testers, etc. They're not always... To add on to that, people don't often have all the language for talking about team dynamics. But once you've got objects, it really um, adds to the language. The, 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 the two together, the talking and the arranging and the moving, creates a much richer language. Right, picture. Yeah. So I was, I was going to add to that, that having um, vision is so much more powerful than having... So in your structure, the notebook became the wall between the two parts. Yeah. Okay. So were there any other creative uses of objects or, or well, comments? I would say that that's, that's a wonderful tool, but I can't do anyway with what the object does. Choosing the right object will make the point very important. Now, it's the paper, and you want to show you know, a three dimensional relationship. It's not going to work. You've got to pull somehow. So yeah. think about it a bit beforehand.
So, so that, that's but so preparation finding the right objects is useful, but the three-dimensional aspect of it adds more possibilities than than flat surface. Okay. I think we're more, um, a lot of times when we create models, we use things like Visio, PowerPoint, and other complicated tools. That often takes a long time. And really, what was useful, again, is the conversation around those models. And the understanding that you got from them. Having that quick visual, that quick picture, is what's most important. Um, and we spend too much time making these perfect diagrams that, in and by themselves, don't have much value. Okay, yes? We got unintended side effects. So in our story, when you add the coffee and the cream, it is better, but when you add the orange juice, <laughs> even though it's showing that the team is more cross functional, it ends up being gross. <laughs> Playing the Joker here in quite a big way. You, you were mixing the drinks and the liquids became part of the uh, part yeah, of the story. We were trying to show that they mixed and that you can get better mixing, but what we ended up with something we did need to show, which is okay. Just a couple more comments. <laughs> yep. Thank you for the uh, simultaneous survey. If you do it with two groups, but you have this uh, intense dialogue between the groups, so they think like a group of developers and a group of investors mingling amongst each other, asking these questions and then downloading what uh, what questions and answers were given. So it's an interesting dynamic, a sim survey with two parts. Yeah. It's, it's what way you bring to two parts. Yeah, what you get is a, a, like an interactive dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, if you're really keen on it, you, you could you, you could review the simultaneous survey using the stones. Let's look at how we were before and how we are now. You might find the team, team dynamics have changed as a result of using a simultaneous survey. Because one of the principles behind this is that groups that talk about their own processes are more highly functioning than groups that find it difficult to talk about their own processes. So if you give them a tool like stones, it um, leads the way to making them more highly functional because it makes them easier to talk about it. Something is going to be critical for their um, good performance. What's interesting is three examples here, really, of, of inter-teams, of relationships between teams, rather than within one team. So that might be a, a very um, useful application. Okay, um, we're kind of weaving in question time into the keynote, which is fine. Um, but I'd like to um, finish, I just want to describe a couple of techniques that fit in the futures box. This is not for trying out because we have about five minutes um, remaining. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to describe a, a couple because uh, for sake of completeness, it'll feel like uh, completing the cycle um, will give me some satisfaction. Okay, so going into the future, you know, it's, it's often a, uh, as I said before, it's often a planning exercise and out come the uh, familiar planning tools where things are, uh, and some of those are quite uh, visual and so on. But there's um, other favorite ways of uh, getting into the future. Um, both, both of these examples are going to be uh, quite visual ones. One I call missing person. I, I really need to find a new name, but I'm going to stick with it for now. It's, uh, the question is, uh, if somebody could join the group right now, or somebody to join the team right now to, to really help us um, sort things out and become more highly functioning. But what kind of person would this person be that could really help uh, dig us out of this hole or, or help us develop more or, or whatever? A magic person. A, a magic person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
And I do say that this shouldn't just be um, a kind of superhero with all kinds of amazing things. It, it should be somebody who is a little bit like the group. They should share some of the qualities, so you don't get completely into the world of fantasy. So they should set, share some of the qualities so that they'll be, um, uh, so that they will fit in. But they'll also bring uh, extra strengths. They might well bring strengths that already exist in the group, but maybe in a bigger way. Um, and it's not just a conversation, it's actually creating the person. Um, and this usually involves a flip chart and a few people with uh, pens drawing an image of this person giving the right kind of hairstyle, the right kind of clothing, and uh, as much as possible is represented through the uh, appearance of the person, uh, but you can also add in labels and words and things to, 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 to build it up. And once this image is created, there's a number of choices. Sometimes that's sufficient, because that itself has been a, a reviewing process, thinking about what's missing, and then that might sort itself out without a plan. Sometimes you want to ask the question, okay, now that you've created this person, um, unfortunately this person does not exist. Some people in the group might challenge you on that point, say, no, we've, uh, this person doesn't exist. It's become real to us. Because the first um, time I uh, used this technique, it was actually a group, um, there one, I've counted out the chairs in the group, and there's one empty chair. And we sat around waiting for this person to arrive. And they didn't, but while we were waiting, the group uh, fantasized about who this person might be. Okay. And it was an outdoor program we were doing. We went out to sleep in a cave. They took an extra sleeping bag with them in case this person got cold. They gave him a name, it was Matt, in case Matt got cold. <laughs> Breakfast the next morning, they laid an extra place at the table. I said, that's for Matt. He said, you're right. <laughs> so they got extra food. They said, Mad isn't hungry this morning, but Mad is very generous. <laughs> so this is where this idea came from originally. And in this original case, it so captured the group's imagination that Matt was real. He was part of the life of that group. So sometimes when you get groups creating imaginary people, they can take on uh, special powers beyond what's uh, expected. Uh, no, but I can tell another application where, where that uh, did happen. But I won't tell that story because we're a little bit uh, short of time. Um, are there any questions? Any other questions just to finish with? Should we call out a day? One question. Just one uh, comment and question. Um, We've, we've come to this general, if I can synthesize, realization that it is truly the conversation that occurs, that, that is facilitated, that builds that greater analysis, interpretation, and thus better team effectiveness. It's the conversation, not the artifact. Yeah. What about continuing forward beyond the moment of that conversation? Would you say that the conversation is where the value occurs, or moving forward into future action plans, uh, is there anything that should be created that comes out of that conversation? Okay, uh, I'll just answer this one question because we're, we're then yep. to time. I think, uh, I don't think I have any silent techniques. I think all of the techniques include conversation. Right? So most of the techniques that I use are a combination of, of conversation and artifacts. The artifacts help the initial conversation. But the artifacts also stick in the memory much more than simply the conversation. So if the conversation has been supported by moving things around or by pictures or by physical uh, movement, it's more likely to be taken into the future. Uh, even a good conversation can get forgotten because there's nothing to... Um, to, but if, if the conversation and the ideas pin to particular movements, objects, shapes, they're, they're far more memorable. So um, that once you get into the realm of using active methods in debriefing, not only do you engage people more in the debrief, 
uh, they're more likely to recall what they've learned and, um, and act on it in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for such a good question because uh, it, I, it, it, it enabled me to um, wrap up in a way that I'd like to. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.